Martin? Oh, I see. Okay, no problem. Matthew, feel free to type in your question. Um, and when you get your Wi-Fi back, you know, let us let me know again. Let me know. Okay, no problem. I'll, I'll wait for you later on. Okay, and we'll come back to you. Um, the other thing is, um, there were a few students who told me they have problems with Albert I.O. with the practice problems that I assigned. Can you guys share with me, did, did some of you have that problem? And if so, can you tell me what exactly was that technical issue that prevented you from trying out those practice problems related to chapter 10? Feel free to type in the chat or, you know, um, or unmute yourself. Um, so uh, the Albert I.O. problems for a couple of, I, I think, I don't remember when you posted it. I think it was like a couple of days ago, but for I think one or two days after that, I would click the link. So my Albert IO was working and I had a regular account. And whenever I just typed in Albert IO, it would work perfectly. But when I clicked on the link, it would just be like a perpetual loading sign. Mm -hmm. But it, it was it was weird because after um, I think two days, when I tried to log into it, it worked perfectly. So I think it was just that period of time for some reason it wasn't loading at all. Mm -hmm. um, did anyone else have that experience where you saw that the Albert I.O. platform kept uh, trying to low or in, was constantly in queue? Okay, Maria is saying that she had the same problem. Okay, so I just want you to know, um, I will have to contact Albert I.O. to figure out what the challenge may have been. Um, okay, the person, the student who just typed in um, admin, can you type in your name? All right, if you are a school administrator, that's fine, uh, but let me know your name so at least I know who I'm talking to. Okay, so in any way, um, I think that if there's a possibility that um, their website may have been overloaded because all of a sudden, all the teachers are utilizing you know, uh, various online platforms. Um, that may be a problem, and I don't want you to worry about that assignment. Um, luckily, um, by sheer coincidence, I gave you a PDF file for practicing Mendelian problems, so I'm going to go over that with you, so you at least know the answers. Now, I want you to know, this morning, when I was getting ready for this meeting, I took a look at how many of you did the assignment, so that I know um, you are ahead of the game, and, uh, and then for those of you who hasn't submitted the work yet, do not worry about it. You, we're going to go through it right now. And then when we're done, you can just upload your work, all right? Um, because the idea is to practice and get you ready to make sure you learn the material. Um, and it's not meant as a test. And I put in the, neg the, the slash line for missing. It's mainly for me to know how many students within a given class has or has not completed the assignment, all right? So just feel free to participate, even if you didn't do it yet. I mean, and that would be even better. Uh, this way, you also get a chance um, how you're doing. Okay, before I start on that part, I want to go over one other thing. I gave you um, lecture 11A on the, on, and I uploaded onto YouTube two, night, two days ago, and there was an exit challenge assignment where you were supposed to read an article and create a poster. So for those of you who has not opened that article yet, I want to tell you, um, it is, this is one of the most exciting parts of the curriculum that, that um, I enjoy working with students. But unfortunately, I can't work with you in person. Now, typically, for this particular article, we would have been reading it in class during a double period. And then you would start a drawing with my presence there, and I would guide you through it. Now, if you go back and look at my video lecture, you will see that I have given you a sample image of what the structure of detail of structure of DNA is compared to the schematic diagram. Um, the detailed DNA structure, um, hold on one second. Sorry about that. Uh, I had some background noise, so I had to tell my family to kind of uh, move away and migrate a little bit. Okay, so what I meant to tell you is the article is a 16-page article. Now, the beauty of that article is the authors, the team of authors who wrote it, they basically um, reveal the different major scientific discoveries related to a DNA structure at different time periods in sequence. They're like pieces of a puzzle but scientists on an uncharted path. It's very much analogous to what the scientists today are dealing with in order to try to figure out a way to handle the new coronavirus. So what essentially has happened in the past history for 
that led up to the modeling of the DNA is that different scientists study different parts of this molecule. And no one has seen this yet. But um, what they then do well, later on um, is that Watson and Crick, because they know about all of these different contents, that the discoveries that were made by other scientists by uh, reading scientific literature, they already have this information in their head. So when they eventually had an opportunity and they took a glance at uh, Rosalind Franklin's photograph 51 of the X-ray image of the DNA molecule, immediately they knew what the significance of that image is, which is the documentary I have assigned to you guys to, to look at. It's a beautiful documentary that has information very carefully laid out from the perspectives from different scientists that some of whom are still alive today, uh, which is why it's so worthy of your time to take a look at. It also would give you a deeper appreciation why there has been so much effort being put in in teaching the next generation, like you guys and myself, about the contributions that Rosin Franklin has made because she never got credited for the work that she has done, and she was not part of the team that got the Nobel Prize. And there's a lot of controversies and, this, and arguments that she was worthy of to share this prize and giving credit to, but there were things that happened behind the scenes that people should know about. In any case, when you draw, and I do expect you to do a hand draw image of this DNA diagram, I want you to do it on a single sheet of paper. It could be eight and a half by 11, or it could be on a longer sheet of paper, but on one side. Um, the students who have done extremely well in the past, they have drawn at least a portion of the DNA molecule in detail, where they will show the sugar phosphate backbone on the two sides that, um, that mix up the size of the double helix. And then they will show the base pairing um, on each end with the molecular structure shown. Now, and then what they did was they showed the twist and turning using a more simplified schematic approach, which is fine. So, so some students choose to do the combination of the two. Some students drew entire molecules um, in detail. This is your choice. Whatever you think would be most clear. Now, what I'm expecting you to do is this. From reading the article, you don't have to show me your annotations or anything like that. I just want you to use the information to then label within this DNA structure, okay, uh, where the DNA base pairing is discovered, that you would draw a line or an arrow pointing towards it to show that Erwin Shargaff was the scientist who uncovered that part of the DNA double helix. And what did he discover? Um, oh, he discovered the ratio between the nitrogen bases um, using different organisms such as, and then you would make a short list, and then next to his name, you would put the date when he published that information and the institution that he had uh, worked in at that time. The thing is that I am not looking for a timeline. Now you can. Some students were asked me this morning from another class, oh, can I do it sequentially along the double helix? Yes, you can. It's entirely up to you. You will find that by the time you're done with this poster, you will see that there were lots and lots of teams of scientists that were involved in making that final piece of structure of DNA that we know of today to make it happen. It really was not the work of just two individuals who figured that all out on their own. It's not. It's really um, scientists building on top of the shoulders of other giants who have come before them, who have made the discoveries before them, um, even though some of them may be about the same age. The one part that you need to put a little bit of work in is what are the other aspects of this DNA molecule, the discoveries that, that, that they have made, that was not included in this article. That's the part that would help you propel your work to a much higher grade. Because that's one of the requirements that I want you to do is to look into a little bit more on your own outside of the article. Everything else, as long as you include it, um, you should be able to get a decent grade from that. Any questions so far regarding this? 11. Benjamin, you may have to mute your, your audio. Oh, because we're hearing oh, we're picking I, up all the I, uh, background information. I thought it was. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, others, do, uh, everyone else, any questions uh, regarding the exit challenge? The example of the drawing is already in the lecture uh, video. Take a look at the last two slides that were there, and it's labeled exit challenge and the sample, and I gave a description v very similar to what I have just explained. Other questions? 
Now I've also created a forum um, in, the, in Jupyter so that after today's review session, if you still have any questions that pop into your mind, feel free to type it in for everyone to see and I will answer them. This way, you don't, no one has to ask the same question more than once or, and, or for me to have to do it multiple times. This way, everyone could, be, could benefit from it. Okay, if you have, don't have any questions on that so far, let me move on to the next item. Okay, the, um, both the Exit Challenge poster and the NOVA documentary. So the NOVA documentary you can find online. I gave you the link. Um, it's about 50, 45 to 50 minutes long. It's really, really good. By the time you're done viewing, I want you to write a one-page summary and then a two-paragraph critique based on your experience and your knowledge about the documentary and focusing on your feedback to it. All, both of these assignments has a regular deadline and then a more extended deadline. Um, the extended deadline goes on to April 20th. So you actually have a week and a half to slowly get this done. If you read just two pages of the article a day, you would hammer this out in no time, all right? Um, so it's not as elaborate as it seems when you, when you look at that document. Okay, um, next thing. Let's talk about uh, one other housekeeping item. Next week, you have a um, alternative schedule, which is the office hour. So next week, every Tuesday, uh, every period two, I'll be holding office hour. I strongly recommend um, you let me know uh, and contact me if you have any questions regarding the schoolwork or if there's something happening. Um, let me be, be upfront with all of you. So I've been having a private chat with some of you um, in the forum here today. Um, I've had one family member that contracted COVID-19. He survived. He's okay. Um, but now my niece has it. And uh, she's out in Long Island. We do not know how she's doing right now. Um, we're still constantly trying to figure things out. And we hope that she will make it. Um, the thing is that this niece of mine has asthma. And you know from all the information you have gotten so far, that doesn't put her in a good position at all. And she's quite young. She's only in her 30s. So things like this um, that happen that could have an impact on your emotional well-being, your psyche. Um, if it happens, first of all, I hope it doesn't happen to any one of you or your family. But if it does, you need to let me know. Um, this way I can support you. This way I can move some of the deadline for you. Um, but if you don't tell me, the fact that I have already made the move to make it a one-week deadline for majority of these assignments, and now some of these with a week and a half, um, I cannot be expected to know this. And I actually do not. I would much prefer that you email me directly. And, and the, the truth of the matter is that um, there has been two to three students um, um, that has emailed me that things like this has happened to either their immediate family or people that they know and has an impact and that they're, they're doing a lot of things to catch up. If it does, let me know, all right? I, what I would do is once I get your information, I would log it onto Jupyter with a note that you can see that I have gotten this um, request from you and that I would have it noted so that when I grade, I can make my um, assessments accordingly. But if I don't know it, and all that I see are empty blank assignments, that does not help with my impression towards you and your work. So please do not put yourself in that position. And the guidance counselors also um, have a lot of work to do. So if you only tell them, but you don't tell me, there is going to be a lag time. And, and the thing is that um, by the time they get to email me, and then by the time I find a time to email you, th there's a lot of time being wasted. So if you can, please just drop me a simple note. That would help alleviate some of your pressure too, so that you don't feel like, oh my God, she, she's going to get angry at me because I didn't do my work, or I'm going to get a zero. Um, it, it could be handled in a more transparent way, all right? Um, so, and that note would only be visible to you and me and nobody else. So please um, take care of yourself and your family. Um, but if it, something does happen, do let me know and so that I could be supportive. Okay, now let's go over the questions. Um, can you do me a favor? Please take out your uh, practice worksheet on chapter 10 on Mendelian genetics so I can go over the answers with you. Okay, now if you know the answer or if you just want to try, and I do encourage you, please type in the answer, uh, but write in the question number as well. All right, so question one the question the worksheet says, an example of genotype is which one of those four choices is 
an example of a genotype. Can you guys let me know? Okay, this is the worksheet that says chapter 10 practice problems for different types of inheritance. Uh, you could also feel free to unmute it and let me know. Okay, yeah. yes, thank, thank you. Yep, you are correct. Thank you for also writing down the number two, Samir, uh, because as we go on to the next 10 problems, uh, it's going to be hard to follow if we don't have a number. You're right, it is choice C, because genotype refers to the uh, alleles, the um, alphabets that are representative of them, not the words and not when you write uh, big R and little r. It really is just the alphabets. Okay, that's correct. Question two, which of the following gives information about phenotype but not genotype? Thank you. Uh, your answers are correct if you choose choice C, because it's a descriptive term that indicates um, what the organism looks like. So in this case, it says tall, that shows a sense of height and stature inside pea plant. Question three, which blood type would not be possible for children of a type A B mother and a type A father? Okay, you guys chose uh, choice A. They cannot have a baby with type O. That is correct. Let me show you the calculation for that just to make sure that we are all on the same page. So let me know. Uh, can somebody unmute and let me know? Can you see this image with the two punnett square side by side? Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you. I hope it's clear enough. So essentially, if a parent is type blood type AB, they would have to be capital I raised to the A, capital I raised to the B. Now, some of you may choose to write just the letters A and B. That's fine. All right. But the thing, the tricky part about this question, and this is a very typical exam question or test question, is um, there are two ways to get blood type A. The person could be homozygous dominant, which is written this way, or heterozygous dominant. But the fact is, in order for a child to be type O, you have to have two lowercase i. And if you look at this set of couple right here, there is no way they will ever have a type O baby. And in this case, there's no way either because there's only one recessive I allele and you need two copies of it, which is why the answer should be type O. Okay, I hope that would help clear it. Um, question number four. Long radishes cross with round radishes result in all oval radishes. So notice that there are three different looks, or three different phenotypes. Um, this type of inheritance is representative of which one? Okay, so far four of you type in choice D. Can one of you explain how did you figure that out? You are correct. It is incomplete dominance. Um, how do you know it is choice D? I think, uh, I, I remembered this, uh, sort of like this question, I think, from one of your lectures. I believe it was 10B. And yeah, it was, I think it was a red flower and a white flower. And they produced a pink flower. And I think yes. that one was labeled as incomplete dominance. Yeah, the snapdragon. Um, essentially, the offspring, the, the, the hint or that gives it away is that the offspring looks different from both of the parents. But having said that, how come you won't choose... Um, Co-dominance, right? Because a type A parent and a type B parent can have a type O baby too. That yeah. that's three different phenotypes. But how come you won't choose choice C? I you know I, I'm gonna be wrong on this, but I always thought that um I th like an example I thought of codominance was AB blood type mm -hmm. yeah. because that's like both are dominant alleles and mm -hmm. and they're both coming together and it's like. It's it, it's not kind of a, it's not a really a mixture of them. It's it's like they're both there completely, but mm -hmm. in incomplete dominance, they kind of mix together and into like one thing that's not either of them. That's right. And the thing is that um, in order for it to be co-dominance, the long radish trait and the round trait has to appear simultaneously at the same time, and both has to be expressed in a new generation. But that's not the case here. The, the, the oval shape, it's neither of what the parents have, all right? And it's certainly not multiple allele uh, in this case um, because you don't, it's due to incomplete dominance. Now, by accident, question five is the same as question three. Um, the differences that I would have asked you to show your work, um, 
I actually put that in twice, but the part of the reason what I was thinking is that in a lot of times on your SAT2 exam, when, when it becomes available for you to take it, you have to remember you only have 60 minutes to answer 80 questions. And if you do the math, that's only three quarters of one minute that you have to read, answer, and bubble in your and choose your answers. So this kind of problem solving has to work pretty fast, which is why I want to give you some practice problem. How about number six? The inheritance of ABO blood groups and humans is best explained by the fact that of the three alleles, an individual must inherit how many? Okay, you guys chose B, you are correct. There has to be two alleles because you get one from the mother and one from the father. All right, question seven. Two parents, both heterozygous for blood type A, produce a child. What are the chances that the child has blood type A? So this one you have to do a pun square. All right, a lot of you are answering this, so let me just show you. Can you please tell me, is this clear? Question seven. Is my positioning in focus for all of you? Or um, should I, can't, I? I can't see the bottom right. Oh, yeah, that, that's better. Okay, good. So now, um, the parents are heterozygous. That means capital I, uh, capital I to the A and little i, or you can write capital IA and then capital O over here. And the same is on this side, right? And if you look at it, three out of four squares are blood type, going to become blood type A phenotype. There's only one quarter of a chance that the baby will have blood type O. That's how the calculation was determined, just in case you were, um, if you haven't worked this out or was puzzled by this one. Okay, number eight is a good question. And by the way, a lot of these practice problems were from the old regions, but on the SAT2 exam, you will get a lot more of these that looks more like number eight. All right, two newborn infants in the hospital lost their ID tags. One baby had blood type O, while the other baby had blood type AB. The two possible sets of parents of these infants had the following blood types. One set of couple had type AB and A, and the second set of couple was type A and type B. If you do a Punnett square for both set of parents, which one of these two sets could have had the child with blood type O? Okay, if you did the calculation, you guys are all correct. The second set of couple is the only one. And can you give me the genotype for both of these parents in the second set that has blood type A and blood type B? How would you write it in order to have a child with blood type O? I see it from Samara. Any, anyone else? What would your guess be? Same thing. Thank you. Thanks for conferring. Okay, you are correct. Um, in this case, both parents have to be heterozygous. So um, what you have written down is correct, both Samira and Yeju. All right. Um, okay. Could blood type have been used to match the babies and parents if both babies had type AB blood? And why? Can someone type in the explanation or you can unmute yourself and participate? Um. No, because both sets of parents have a possibility of having a type AB child, which yes. will not give them a clue to which babies to switch. That's right. So in this case, if, um, thank you, Dominic. So in this case, um, if the doctors know whether these babies have um, type O and type AB positive or negative, remember the RH factors, then it will be a little bit more helpful. But nonetheless, these days we'll be doing more of a uh, genetic uh, testing, uh, like DNA, looking at the DNA. All right. Let's take a look at nine and 10, which is focused on um, more detailed analyses, okay? Hemophilia is also known as factor eight deficiency, a recessive sex link condition in which one of the proteins needed to form blood clots is missing or reduced. Thus, a hemophiliac bleeds longer than a person without the condition. The normal daughter of a man with hemophilia married a man who is normal for the trait. How would you write the genotype for the woman and then the man that she married? Good. Samara, you're really fast. Okay, your answer is correct. So the way I had it um, written down 
let me project it for all of you, would look something like this. Is this clear? Can you all see it? Um, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, can you zoom, uh, zoom out a little? Uh, zoom out a little. Yeah, that, that's good. Okay, thank you. Uh, the distance is a little bit harder to judge for me. Good, thank you. So um, the reason why you would write the female, first of all, whenever you're dealing with a sex-linked condition, always write down the genotype for the sex, whether it will be XX or XY. And then right next to it, you have to denote the letter, the type of allele that they receive. Um, in this particular case, the female has a father who's a femophiliac, which means she has to get one of the X's from her father, which is why we know it has to be a recessive H because other people could be a carrier and still be normal. Um, but the other gene that was not mentioned that she got from the mother, um, it's assumed to be normal automatically. So that's the reason why we write down X to the capital H, which is the normal trait, and then the hemophiliac trait, which is the one she got from her father, which is why it's important that we indicated that um, her father had the condition. In the men's case, then this is a little bit tricky. Um, you have to be able to, you have to know that hemophilia is an uh, excellent trait, meaning it's a trait that is found on the X chromosome. And in this particular case, um, the man is normal for a trait, sorry, this should be capital H. Um, I wrote a recessive H. Marry man who's normal for the trait. Okay, so capital H. So instead it should have looked like this. All right, so what are the chances when you do a Punnett square um, that the future daughter would be hemophiliac? Can you guys share with me? When you're done drawing the uh, Punnett squares, you should only look at the female side, which are two of the boxes. Um. Okay, 0% chance you are right. There is no way that the girls will be having it. So one way you can reason it out is that in order for the girls to be a true hemophiliac, um, she needs two defective copies, one bad copy from the father and one bad copy from the mother. In this case, the father is normal. So she's gonna be a carrier, but she's not gonna be a full, having full-blown hemophilia. Um, what about the next question? Uh, by the way, I had a typo in there. I'm so sorry, I just caught it before. Uh, what is the probability that their future son will be a hemophiliac? Okay, good. Thank you, Samara, Ben, and Wei Chen. So can you see this um, pen square? Can you guys tell me? Can you see it? Should I move back or forward? I can see it. Is, you can see it? Is it good? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank oh, you. Well, How about well. this? Any better? I want to make sure you can see it. Otherwise, it's yeah, that's good. Like okay. Like that. Good. So now, if you take a look at this, right? Um, when they ask you about the daughters, you should only look at these two boxes in the top, at least the way I had drawn this. So the two daughters, there's no way that she could be hemophilia. She, this one could be a carrier, but this one is completely normal. And of the two boys, 50% of it, it's normal, but 50% of it is not, which is the one I circled in orange. So that's the reason why the calculation for the answer should be 50. Now, next one, number 10. Uh, pseudo, yes? Oh, it's just, this is like a trip. This is like a little question. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter um, what, like, whether we write like the male on top or the feet, the male on the side, right? Isn't yeah, it doesn't matter. Yep. That, that's why I said uh, I happen to have put the two females on the top. But in, if you switch the order of the parents, as long as you put all of the genotypes of one parent on each side, then it doesn't matter which one you put on first. The calculation would result to be the same. Okay, thank you for asking that question. Okay, uh, question 10. Pseudo-hypertrophic muscular dystrophy is a disorder that causes gradual deterioration of the muscles. It is seen only in boys born to apparently normal parents, and it usually results in death in the early teens. Question A, is this caused by a dominant or recessive allele? If you said recessive, you are all correct. Those of you enter it, thank you. How can you tell it's a recessive allele or a recessive trait? 
Uh, because if it wasn't recessive, at least one of the parents would have it. Mm -hmm. Very good. And they have normal parents. That's right. Um, so it's a hidden trait, right? In order for it to be hidden, it has to be recessive. All right. Um, part B, is its inheritance sex-linked or autosomal? How can you tell? Okay. Sex-linked is correct. How can you tell? It's only in boys. That's right. Um, it's it's more slanted to in that direction. All right. Question C. Explain why this is order. This is order is always seen in boys and rarely in girls. You can use Punnett square to illustrate your idea. So can anyone? Would anyone like to unmute or answer or type it in? Good. Both of your explanations are good. You're right. Girls need to have, um, because the gene for, um, just like in hemophilia, because the gene for pseudomuscular dystrophy is found on the X chromosome. Now, not all traits are found on X chromosome. Some are found on Y. I'll, I'll, I'll speak to that in just a moment. But the, the fact is that if you know the allele that is determining the trait is found in X chromosome, well, females have two copies of it, which means she also needs two defective copies for her to have that trait reveal itself. But for men, they only have one X and the other one is a Y. So depending on which copy he inherits on the X, that basically determines whether he has it or he doesn't. So if a guy gets the a recessive H allele, um, or in this case, for muscular dystrophy, he immediately will have the trait showing up in the body. Um, but female would take you know, two defective copies for that to happen. So your explanation is correct. Okay. Um, all right. Now, sure. yes. Oh, um, so for the number nine, like the ABC, if we wrote a Punnett square on like A, would mm -hmm. we need to like redraw the Punnett square for each one? No. Because, no. Okay. No. Um, and uh, for if you're concerned about doing something like this for um, exam or homework, right, you can just point an arrow to it on an exam uh, because of the platform we're using, you might most likely you would be writing in sentences to explain. Um, because I think the drawing function, I, I'm not so sure how good it is on Jupiter. Um, so anyway, um, one other thing that I want to mention to all of you before we close is that um, there are traits that are found in Y chromosome, for example, for um, the condition like erectile dysfunction, right? The function of the penis is dictated by the Y chromosome. So those are some of the traits that are found there. Um, next Tuesday, I mean, ne not next Tuesday, the next week, the entire week, um, I, will, I will be holding an office hour during period two for all of my classes. I strongly recommend that if you have any questions, don't be shy. Make an appointment with me. Just shoot me an email uh, via Jupyter message. And, uh, and so we can set which day on next week during period two, we can have a quick meeting. You won't be holding, we won't be holding regular classes. Um, I think you may have gotten that message. If not, you will be getting it from the school. Um, for the remaining of this week, um, the assignments pretty much that I have uploaded will be it. So you have a lot, you have essentially a week and a half to go through the 16 page article uh, uh, to make your one poster. But remember, you don't have to annotate. I'm not expecting to collect any of that. You just have to use the information to, you know, draw out that poster and also watch uh, the documentary. And I hope that you guys can have a chance to recuperate and maybe use the time to catch up on any work that you may have been missing. Are there any other questions? Chan. Yes. Um, so will you, you'll be holding office hours every day, right? Every day during period two. As a matter of okay. fact, it's not just me. It's all your teachers. They will oh. be holding office hour either period one or period two, depending on their own teaching schedule. For me, it would be period two. I, I'm, because I, I'm worried that may cause um, scheduling conflicts for me because I normally have my Spanish lecture. Oh, you won't be having two. any. The next week, there will be no, um, the counselors are taking over. So essentially a whole week would be, um, from what I have gathered from the school, the counselors will be holding special sessions with everyone. There are no classes being held next week, as far as I understand. Okay. Yeah, okay. which is why you see on Jupiter for our class calendar, it's blank, 
right? So essentially I have, um, I gave you uh, fewer, I gave you only one lecture and, uh, and then two assignments. So I'm kind of operating it kind of as though we have our normal spring break, even though the chancellor has changed it. Um, but I gave you assignments that are, um, in the case of the poster, that's just a little bit more reading, but also accommodating the fact that some of you may be celebrating Thursday and Friday, and so you have less, less stress, and you can wait until next week to do your work, but, but do pace yourself, all right? Because a week and a half to do uh, one poster is an enormous amount of time. But if you have any questions, there's a Jupyter forum that I set up. Feel free to post your question there. I'll be more than happy to answer them, and then any personal ones too. You know, you can also schedule a private session with me, no problem at all. Any other questions, students? Okay, if that's it, uh, this concludes our review session. Thank you all very much for joining me. It's a pleasure hearing all of you and having an in-class interaction. That is so cool. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Oh, one last thing I almost forgot. Um, I'm in the midst of deciding whether to use Google Meet or use Microsoft Teams. Um, uh, there is a good chance that I might lean towards Google Meets only because um, you already have a Sty email account and that might be easier. But I still have to go through all of my um, meeting notes, recordings, just like you would with my lecture to learn some of these different platforms and see what the functionality is. I will send you a separate email um, either later this week or the next week. Um, your exam results, I'll be switching that on and letting you know. We've had a pro few problems with a couple of students with personal issues. So that's why I did not show you your grades for quite some time. So I'll turn that on and then we'll talk about doing test correction, things like that down the road, okay? But in the meantime, have a good break and uh, enjoy your time with your family and cherish all of them. All right, take care my students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.